Hi, everyone. This is Sam Silverman, managing partner of EV5AN. Thank you for taking time to join us on today's webinar. Today, we're going to be chatting about why EV5 is better now. Uh, as many of you know, the EV5 program was reinstated with the EV5 Reform and Integrity Act, which went into effect in March of 2022, uh, which implemented many uh, significant changes and improvements on the EV5 program. And that new legislation combined with a number of changes in the interest rate market and general economy have kind of resulted in a number of, of changes to the investment landscape. And so today we're gonna to be walking through those changes and kind of explaining why now uh, compared with over 25 years of EB-5 program activity in the past is a good time to consider making an EB-5 uh, visa, visa investment. During the webinar, if you have questions, please use the chat box. We'll try and cover uh, as many questions as we can at the end of the webinar. Uh, and if you want to get a copy of the slides, please reach out to us at info at eb5an.com. And we'll try and uh, we'll, we'll get you a copy of those slides too. Okay, here's a quick overview of what uh, we're going to cover on, on today's webinar. First, we'll chat a little bit about EB5AN and the EB5 visa program. Um, then uh, we'll shift, we'll introduce Ron Clasco and Clasco Immigration Partners. And then we'll talk uh, about the main topic of today's presentation, why, why EB5 is, is better now. And then we'll wrap up uh, with sharing some details about some of our current available rural and urban uh, EB5 investment projects that are available today in both the um, in both categories at at the eight hundred thousand dollar amount okay so quick quick overview about eb5an we're an eb5 investment fund manager and uscis approved regional center operator we've been in this space since 2013. Uh, eb5 is a government immigration program administered by u.s citizenship and Immigration Services, USCIS, uh, which oversees the program and makes sure that EB-5 investments create at least 10 new jobs to qualify uh, for the permanent residency. Okay, a little bit more about EB-5AN. As I mentioned, we got started in 2013. Uh, we operate more than 10 EB-5 regional centers uh, that cover the entire continental United States. Uh, we've worked on many, many projects around the country, uh, ranging from smaller projects to larger projects. One of the things that uh, sets us apart from many of the other EB-5 regional center operators and investment companies is we're 100% committed to investment transparency. So we're one of the few operators that makes all of the 956F exemplar documents available to clients considering making an investment, the complete template, along with uh, any of the financial statements uh, and balance sheet information as well, uh, so that clients can have the full uh, picture before uh, before making an investment uh, an, an investment decision. One of the other things that is a little bit unique about our approach is that we have hundreds and hundreds of articles and videos on our website that help investors get more details about how to select an investment and what are the different um, key factors to consider when, uh, when evaluating potential investment options. All right. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I'm Sam Silverman, one of the two managing partners, uh, and joined uh, on the webinar today with my partner, Mike. And I'll let Mike jump in and introduce himself and share a little bit about his background and, and experience. Perfect. Thanks, Sam. And for I'm glad uh, we were able to overcome some technical difficulties. Uh, yeah, as, as you can see on the screen, um, 
I'm, I'm one of the co-founders with Sam. Both of us used to work at the Boston Consulting Group many years ago, and uh, we wanted to bring more of that institutional approach to EB5. And if you fast forward 10 years, uh, we believe we brought some best-in-class projects to market. We've increased transparency within the industry, uh, and we're proud of the track record uh, of our regional centers and uh, of the 100% approval we have for our investors. Perfect. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. Uh, we also have Ahmed Khan uh, on our team as well, who's with us. And uh, I'll let Ahmed jump in and introduce himself, share a little bit about his background and experience. Uh, and then we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll continue on and, and introduce Ron shortly. Yep. Thanks, Sam. Um, thanks for the introduction. Hi, everyone. My name is Ahmed Khan. Uh, as Sam mentioned, I'm currently the vice president here at EB5AN. And in my prior life, uh, I was also an immigration attorney, a proud graduate of the Ron Clasco School of Hard Knocks. So I actually started my career with uh, Ron and his firm and learned a lot there and ultimately has ended up with over a decade of experience, both as a filing attorney and also as a regional center executive. So um, yeah, glad to be glad to be part of the webinar today and share my experience and perspective. Perfect, thanks, thanks Ahmed. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, we have regional centers that cover the whole country, which allows us to select the most compelling projects, uh, both rural and urban and rural regardless of geographic location, uh, which gives us an advantage in terms of bringing the most compelling projects to market for investors. We've worked with thousands of investors from around the world. This is a map showing where many of our prior uh, investors have come from over the years, more than 60 countries, although this is a little bit uh, outdated at this point. Um, we've also had the opportunity to be featured in a number of leading publications uh, around the world um, in terms of policies, um, updates, and projects. Uh, most recently, just a few days ago in the New York Post as well. All right, and now it's my pleasure to introduce Ron Clasco and Clasco Immigration Partners. Ron is a, is a legend in the EB-5 space. Uh, his reputation precedes him, and uh, thankfully he was able to carve out some time today to, to join us and share share his thoughts. The impetus for this webinar was actually a blog post um, written by Ron that, that went live just a couple of weeks ago. And with that, I'll turn it over and Ron, let you introduce yourself and kind of share a little bit about Classico Immigration Law Partners and kind of what the idea was behind, behind this post and webinar. Sure, happy to participate. Thank you, Sam, Mike, and Ahmed. Uh, and for those of you who don't know me, I, I think my bio is on the screen, but uh, I chair the, uh, the law firm Classico Immigration Law Partners. We're one of the largest uh, immigration law firms in the world. We have about 125 people just doing U.S. immigration law. And certainly a very big part of our firm is our EB-5 practice. Um, I head up the EB-5 practice. We are divided into a few parts. Uh, our EB-5 practice includes uh, a group that works with investors, and we've assisted thousands of investors through the EB-5 process from all over the world. Um, we have a separate group within the EB-5 team that uh, works with regional centers and developers. We form regional centers. We put projects together. Um, and uh, kind of a subspecialty is when there's a project that goes wrong, people often call on us to help the investors in the project. Um, we also have one of the biggest EB-5 litigation practices, and I guess our most famous case in recent years was the litigation that reopened uh, the EB-5 program. I served as the chair of the EB-5 committee of the American Immigration Lawyers Association for five years. Um, and, and you can kind of see my bio and the information about, uh, about our law firm. And very happy to be here. Uh, as, as, uh, as Sam mentioned, um, the background of this is a blog, but I'll give you the background of that. So we within our, you know, the classical immigration practice has certainly noticed that uh, these are boom times. We're all very, very busy uh, with all types of EB-5 work. And that raises all kinds of different issues uh, that we come across that we advise our clients on. And so we decided that it would be a good idea that uh, each month 
we will publish a different blog on a different topic uh, of, uh, regarding some of the hot issues in EB-5. Uh, and then I said, well, maybe the first blog, before we get involved in specific issues, is just talking about where we are now, how we got there, and why things are pretty good right now. And so I decided the first blog was going to be why EB-5 is better, you know, better than it was before, better than anything else, better than ever, um, however you want to complete the sentence. But I was inspired to, uh, to do a blog on that subject. Um, and, uh, you know, Sam and Mike and Ahmed were good enough to pick up on my blog and suggest we do a webinar. And that's what brings me here. And I'm happy to talk about it. So the, what we're going to talk about the fact that EB5, you know, has had its ups and downs. Um, and, you know, we certainly came through the, maybe the biggest down. Uh, when the program lapsed in 2021, and then the program was started up again in, in March of 22 by the EB-5 Reform and Integrity Act, but it really took some time to get the program off the ground. In fact, we had to go to federal court to get the program off the ground. Um, so it really is in 2023 and into 2024 that you know, the program is somewhat stabilized now. Uh, and we're seeing lots of activity at all levels. You know, regional centers are forming, projects are being developed, investors are investing. So after a period of perhaps our biggest downtime when the program lapsed, we're now in, a, in the boom times. And in deciding to do this blog, I, I said, well, all right, well, yes, we are in the boom times, but why? And I came up with about eight or nine different reasons why EB-5 is better now. And that's what we're going to talk about. So the first thing I came up with is that it, we finally have a long-term extension of the regional center program. So most of you uh, know that the regional center po program is still a temporary program that needs to be extended periodically. Uh, and in fact, it's been extended probably over 20 times, uh, everywhere from some number of days to, to several years uh, until it lapsed in, uh, in July of 2021. The really good news is the, the RIA uh, not only extended the program, because we had seen a lot of three-month extensions and six-month extensions and one-year extension, uh, and that doesn't show a lot of confidence in the program, but the RIA extended the program for five years and created a grandfather clause that says that if you invest before the program expires, even if the program expires, you're still saved and your, your process will go through. Well, that's a really big deal. Uh, and that inspired confidence at all levels, you know, from developers being willing to do projects, knowing that this program isn't going to end anytime soon, investors willing to invest, knowing that if the program lapses again, they're still protected. So the, the concept of a long-term five-year extension, which was really a long time in coming, is probably deserving of being first in line for why EB-5 has gotten better. If there's one specific provision in the RIA that I think has had as much or more to do with uh, uh, the boom time for investors, uh, it, it probably isn't what I would have thought when I first looked at the law, but what it is is the, the provision for concurrent adjustment. So the concept of concurrent adjustment always existed for EB-1, EB-2, and EB-3. So if you have an extraordinary ability petition or uh, an, an EB-2 or EB-3 petition based on employment, um, and you and your quota was current, you could always apply for a 485, an adjustment of status application, at the same time as you filed your I-140 petition. But with EB-5, you had to wait for the approval of the I-526 petition before you could file for adjustment of status. So one of the things that we lobbied hard for and got in the RIA is that EB-5 should be treated the same as the other categories. And in fact, it is now. So that assuming the quota is current, 
you can f apply the 526 or 526E and the 485 at the same time. Now, what this means is it opens up the ability at the same time to file for employment authorization and hopefully get that within three or four months and also file for a travel document that allows you to travel in and out of the country while this is going on. And that takes longer, but maybe six to nine or six to 10 months later, you'll have that. This has especially been a huge deal for our Indian clients who are in EB2 and EB3 quota waiting lines that will likely last for decades and that prevent them until the quota is current from applying for adjustment of status. All of a sudden, there's a category, EB5, that lets them get out of that and get apply for adjustment of status immediately, get a work document, get a travel document, be able to switch employers if they want to do that, um, and it's really changed their lives. So concurrent adjustment is, is, a, is a major benefit that has significantly increased uh, the population of investors. Uh, on, on the next slide, it includes a, um, uh, a chart showing the, the visa bulletin uh, and the fact that the quota is current for new filings, new I-526s or 526Es that are in rural areas or in high unemployment areas. Um, so e even though the quota for uh, previously filed cases may not be current, post-RIA cases in rural areas or high unemployment areas are current and therefore the ability exists to apply for adjustment of status. And the next slide shows some of the advantages of rural projects. And we'll go ahead to the next slide, which, which ties this together, which is called priority processing. And so the RIA uh, created a new concept that never existed before called priority processing. Now, we didn't really know what it, first of all, it only applies to rural projects. And we never knew what exactly it would mean, but it's turned out that USCIS has taken that very seriously and they really do give priority processing to rural projects. Uh, and then, you know, our rural projects, the, the I-526Es tend to get adjudicated much faster than even the high unemployment area uh, TEA projects. Uh, we have seen some 526Es for our clients approved as quickly as a month or so. Uh, I would say probably in the six month range, maybe more average or normal. Uh, but the bottom line is it's way quicker than other applications. And what that means is if you're eligible for concurrent adjustment and you can get the your I-526E approved with priority processing within several months, you can be done the whole process and have your green card in a year or less. And, and we've actually seen that happen. So priority processing for rural projects has been uh, a very major uh, impetus to uh, investments in rural projects, which was certainly one of the goals of the RIA. And Ron, now Another, that, that, Ron, just, sorry to interrupt, but now that now that that information is pretty pretty widely accepted and is being seen, you know, not just with investors that have hired your firm to do their applications, how how are you seeing kind of investor interest, you know, for new clients coming in, you know, this month, last month? you know, in terms of their preference for, for doing a rural project versus, versus a non-rural project. And obviously that yeah, is kind so, of evolving over time. Yeah, I, I, I'd say there, there's two groups. There's clients of ours for whom the major or a major um, uh, motivation is timing. And for those, when we explain the timing advantages of, of rural projects, uh, they generally tend to want to see rural projects 
uh, ahead of anything else. And if they see a rural project that they think is good both for EB-5 and for financial purposes, then they tend to invest in rural projects to a far greater extent uh, than any other time uh, since I've been practicing. Um, there's others of our clients uh, for whom the timing is not the critical issue, uh, who you know, do have just a, a greater comfort level, which is something we've seen historically um, with uh, projects in major cities. Um, and for those, uh, you know, if it's uh, going to be a major project in, in, in New York or San Francisco or Miami or Houston or, uh, or Los Angeles, uh, you know, they, they tend to show a favoritism towards cities they've heard of uh, as long as it's a targeted employment area in one of those cities. So, Sam, I would say that uh, certainly for a significant group of our clients, um, they have a far greater interest in rural projects than they did before. And and Ron, so there's, you know, kind of double clicking on that first category and the second category. In in your opinion, how does country of birth and ability to adjust status, how do those two items kind of fit into the rural versus urban, you know, decision framework that you're seeing? Yeah. So uh, if if your if your country well, if your country of birth is India, uh, and so many of our Indian clients are Indian clients in the U.S., often in H-1B status, uh, in the you know in the never-ending EB-2 EB-3 quota weight, um, and so for our Indian clientele, the uh, it, it's absolutely critical to be able to file for concurrent adjustment. And therefore, their only interest is in something where the quota is current, and that, of course, is, is either a high unemployment TEA or, or a rural area. Um, there's, you know, there's, there's certainly interest in, um, in in rural projects, and uh, um, but I think the number one concern is something that is current where they can file for concurrent adjustment. Uh, in our, with our Chinese clientele, there's, there's an awful lot of interest in, in rural projects. Uh, you know, a lot of the, uh, uh, the Chinese agents are painfully aware of the, uh, of how long the processing, you know, the, the fact that uh, some of the old cases are in 10 to 15 year backlog. Um, and there's certainly concern that high unemployment uh, TEAs that are current today may not be current at some point in the near future, and we'll be talking about this as we go. Uh, so we do see, a, uh, at least with a number of our Chinese agents, uh, a great interest in rural projects. Got it, got it. And, and generally, a lot of those Chinese investors are not eligible for the adjustment of status, so that, that does make sense. Yeah, I think it's a good idea. That I'm glad you brought that up when you say Chinese are not eligible. Um, one of the things that I, I should mention when we talk about concurrent adjustment uh, is that there are risks in concurrent adjustment. And we get involved in advising our Chinese clients a lot about these risks. So the concept of concurrent adjustment is that you must be in legal status in the United States in, in order to apply for adjustment of status. So if you're on an H visa, um, for example, as many of our Indian clients are, it's no issue. They're in legal H-1B status and they're eligible to file for concurrent adjustment. Well, everybody around the world, including in China, has heard that, well, there's this great thing, concurrent adjustment. So all I really have to do is get a B1, B2 visitor visa, come to the U.S., and then file an EB-5 petition and an I-485, and I never have to leave. And, and you know, we see, we consult on this a lot, and we see this a lot, and it can be a very large problem um, because when you're applying for adjustment of status, you need to show that when you entered the country, you intended to come here temporarily. If you're coming on a B-1, B-2 visa, 
you need to prove that you intended just to visit the U.S. and then leave. So if you come to the U.S. Uh, you know, today, and then next week, you file an, an EB-5 petition and an adjustment of status concurrently, you may have a very difficult burden to satisfy the immigration service that you really intended to come temporarily and something happened in a week that made you change your entire future plan. And that may be, you know, very difficult to be credible. And what ends up happening is if the immigration service believes that you uh, intended to apply for a green card when you entered the U.S., then they can and will deny your adjustment of status in one of two ways, either based on something called preconceived intent, that you had a preconceived intent to apply for a green card and therefore we're, adjusting, we're denying your adjustment of status, which still allows you to apply for a green card at the U.S. consulate overseas, or even worse, the immigration service can say that we think you lied at the airport when you arrived here, and therefore we're charging you with fraud or misrepresentation, and that can be a, pretty much a lifetime bar. So there has developed a, a policy or a rule where people have heard that, well, as long as I wait 90 days after arrival in the United States uh, and I don't apply for my green card until after 90 days, I'm safe. Um, and the answer is no, that's not right. You may be safer. In other words, if you wait 90 days, it may be possible to show that something happened and you changed your mind. It's a lot easier to show that you changed your mind after 90 days than after one week. But it doesn't prevent the immigration service from still saying, we think you always intended to apply for a green card. So uh, my advice to all investors is that before you plan on a strategy of getting a B1, B2, coming to the US and applying for adjustment of status, have a very serious and careful conversation with an experienced uh, EB5 immigration lawyer who's been through this and, and then make your decision. Yeah, and one of the things so I'll that, add to that, Ron, yeah. just to totally agree with everything you just said is, yeah, one of the things that people don't realize is this happens not necessarily at the I-526 stage, Right. So we're seeing some pretty, pretty, you know, relatively faster processing times for especially for rural petitions on the 526 E's. But the, the, this, the ramifications of kind of taking this risk will really manifest towards the end of the process of the adjustment, which could be two years down the line. And, you know, that could be catastrophic for, let's say, someone who's got maybe a child who's going to age out or someone who just can't afford that extra time, maybe ends up in the backlog or something like that. So really important consideration for those who are, who are thinking about that as a route. Um, you know, it's a pretty pretty high risk of, you know, what could go wrong versus simply just waiting it out overseas, especially if you're in a rural project that might get approved in, you know, 12 to 15 months, which we've been seeing pretty often. Yeah, very good points, Ahmed, thank you. Mm -hmm. So the next thing uh, that I wanted to talk about on my list of reasons why EB-5 is better now um, is something called 245K. And this was added in the same part of the RIA as concurrent adjustment. And this is similar to concurrent adjustment in that it's a benefit that always existed for EB-1, 2, and 3, but until the RIA, it never existed for EB-5. And what it says is that not only are we going to allow concurrent adjustment, which normally requires you to be in legal status when you file for adjustment, but we're also going to say that, well, if you've been out of legal status, but for less than 180 days, we'll still allow you to apply for adjustment of status. And again, that's a big thing because there are certainly people who've been in the U.S. for a long time who've had some violations of status, hopefully for short periods, or maybe they, they got terminated or quit their H-1B employer uh, and they're now out of status. As long as it's less than 180 days, 
they're still eligible to apply for adjustment of status. The next uh, thing I listed, which is actually the core of the RIA, is investor protections. So, you know, in, in Congress's mind, one of the main things that it wanted to accomplish with the RIA was protecting investors against fraudulent projects. And unfortunately, the history of EB-5 is riddled with, uh, you know, developers who did some wrong things uh, and, 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 you know, went away with uh, the investor's money without the project being built. And, and the, one of the core objectives of the RIA was to develop a whole series of investor protections, uh, which are obviously good. And if you're an investor on the call, uh, the good news for you, it, even though this is a lot more work and expense for regional centers and projects, the good news for you as an investor is that there are all sorts of things that now protect you against fraudulent projects. Um, projects have to have either fund administrators um, and segregated accounts for each investor or, or, certif or audits um, of the of the project, which didn't exist before. The immigration service is going to be coming out a lot more often for site visits and, and, and government audits of projects. Um, there are all sorts of transparency provisions regarding uh, uh, promoters and marketers of EB-5 uh, that, that never existed before. Uh, there's all sorts of money that has to be paid to the government called integrity fees. Uh, that enables the government to have a cadre of fraud investigators. So the bottom line is, and one of the reasons why EB-5 I think is better, is there's nothing that any government can do to positively prevent any fraudulent activity from ever happening. But the chances of that today are certainly far less uh, than they were before the RIA. Now, that ties in a little bit to the next thing on my list, which is the good faith investor provisions within the Reform and Integrity Act. So one of the problems we always had is that, yes, there were fraudulent projects. There were, in addition to fraudulent projects, there were projects where there was no fraud, but for various reasons, it just didn't go forward because of economic reasons or, or COVID or bankruptcies or whatever. Through no fault of the investors, the project simply didn't happen or didn't create the necessary number of jobs. And one of the good things that we were happy to see in the RIA that we certainly lobbied for, although it's not as good as we hoped, is protections for good faith investors where there are either failed or fraudulent projects. And it's good to know that the Immigration Service agreed with our position that the good faith investor provisions are uh, protect not only investors subsequent to the RIA, but also investors prior to the RIA. So that's all good. And basically what it says is if a regional center is terminated, it used to be if a regional center was terminated, in many cases there was nothing the investor could do, and even though the project's fine, if the regional center is terminated, uh, it's considered a material change for the investor, and he has to start all over again. Very, very unfair. The, the RIA says if the regional center is terminated, you can affiliate with a different regional center within 180 days, and your, your EB-5 case can move forward. All right, that's good. Um, the other thing it says is even if the regional center is not terminated, because that maybe the regional center didn't do anything wrong, but the project itself failed or was fraudulent, there's a provision to, uh, to, uh, for the investors to be protected if the NCE or the, the investment entity or the JCE, the job creating entity, is debarred. That's a new concept uh, in EB-5. And it says that if, if, there, if there's a problem with a project and the project is debarred, then the investors can, uh, if there's any money left, take whatever money is left 
and invested in another project that's going to create the jobs and, and they, their case can go forward. And so there are lots of EB-5 projects out there that have many, many, many excess jobs that will be happy to take some money from failed projects uh, and, and, and protect the investors. There's only one problem. And that is, as we sit here two years after the RIA was, uh, came into effect, the USCIS has not yet come up with rules or procedures for debarment. So we have many projects where the investors have a right under the, under the law to do things that will enable them to get their green cards, even though the project failed, because the USCIS has not yet implemented the debarment provision the good faith investors can't take advantage of that. So that's something uh, certainly our law firm is working on actively right now. Um, so good faith investors is a very significant advantage for investors, but we need action from the immigration service to, uh, uh, to get the full advantage of that. I think it was uh, Sam at the beginning who talked about you know, various things that are occurring uh, that have made EB-5 uh, you know, has resulted in more EB-5 projects being available on the market. Uh, and that's certainly true. Uh, the, you know, the not only increased uh, investor interest, uh, but and not only the long-term extension of the program, but also the unavailability of capital, the high interest rates have made EB-5 financing much more attractive than it was in the in the low interest rate days. Uh, and so what we have today is probably as much or more than I ever recall in my, I guess, going on 30 years of, of, of working on EB-5 matters, uh, we have really a lot of good projects out there uh, for investors to, to access. So that's, uh, that's certainly good news. Uh, the last thing I'll mention on why EB-5 is better now is, is a somewhat controversial one. And I wasn't sure whether I should put this on the list. And that is the USCIS's recent statement about the sustainment period. And this gets a little bit complicated. I know, uh, uh, we did with EB-5AN a, a whole webinar on, on this subject, so I'll just summarize it. And basically what's going on is the it's always been necessary under the law for investors to not get their money back until at least they have complete until they have completed at least two years after they get their conditional green card. And that regulation is still on the books. However, a short time ago, the Immigration Service posted on its website and issued a memo and said, well, we interpret the RIA to say that it is not necessary for investors to sustain their investment for the two years of conditional resident, but only for a total of two years after you make your investment even if your EB-5 petition isn't approved yet, even if you haven't gotten a conditional green card, even if you haven't filed an 829, you can get your money back. Well, that's kind of at one level sounds pretty great for investors, but there are all sorts of problems with that. Number one is most good projects need money for a lot longer than that. Number two is there's a lot of questions about when the two years begin and end, and it does, two years doesn't really mean two years. And another is there's questions about what, whether you follow what the Immigration Services website posting and memo says, or whether you follow the regulation that's still on the books. And lastly, there's a lawsuit that's been filed challenging the sustainment period on the basis that it wasn't done right, that it had to be done through what's called rulemaking under the Administrative Procedure Act. So the reason it's on the list is because the concept of being able to make shorter term investments has attracted a lot of interest. 
but then there's also a lot of investors who are rightfully weary of uh, of what that really means and how it's going to play out. So Sam, Mike, and Ahmed, uh, those are my thoughts on why, as we sit here in uh, in April of 2024, EB5 is pretty good. <laughs> yep, and really appreciate that, Ron. And I, I would second most all, everything that you said. And I'd say that in terms of the industry, um, this is about as healthy as it's been in the last decade, really since China backlogged uh, back in 2015-16. I'd say that this is the most excitement that we've seen in the industry. And uh, for a whole different set of investors as well, a lot of uh, Indian nationals on H-1B in the U.S. that didn't have a clear path. This is a great solution. Also, for those in a rush, we now have a fast solution that isn't taking three to five years. So we'd agree with all of that. And uh, definitely the, the recent lawsuit challenging the sustainment period is a sticky subject. And we just held a webinar on that a week ago because uh, there's lots of different views on that. We've made our view pretty clear. Uh, and the, the main takeaway from that that we don't like is uncertainty. We hate that anything that creates uncertainty for investors, especially those that already invested, that's bad for the industry. That's bad for everyone for, and for the future of the program. So that, that's one of the biggest issues that we have is just uncertainty. And almost all of these points that you've made go on the other direction, which is about certainty. And I think that with certainty of fast processing times on the concurrent filing of having fast results on the rural set asides of all of those different things, I see that that is my main takeaway of why the program's gotten so successful over the last year. And I think we'll, we'll boom for the next at least couple of years. Ahmed, do you want to share share your thoughts as well here? Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, thanks so much, Ron, for coming on and sharing a lot of those insights. Obviously, you know, you're in the trenches and you and your team are in the trenches, kind of seeing what investors are going through on a day-to-day -day basis. And yeah, I mean, we've, we've all kind of seen how the industry has evolved over the last uh, 10 or so years. And, and there's been a lot of different ups and downs, but I think we're in a really good spot. It's obviously an opportune spot for a lot of investors, both overseas and in the U.S. And I think that, you know, one of the things that people talked about was when, when the RIA was passed was, okay, great, here's a window of opportunity, right? And I think right now we're kind of at that halfway point with that window of opportunity. It's not as wide open as it was maybe in, you know, early last year or even right after the RIA, but there's still a lot of opportunity for those investors who are looking to find a solution whether it's you know someone who's abroad who's looking to make a long-term move to the United States, whether it's someone who's in the U.S. and in a backlog category in EB2 and EB3, um, but it was, it's not always going to stay this way, right? And as as we kind of continue to see more and more interest and more and more people file into the into the program and a lot of the quotas get filled up, I think um, you know pe people will kind of rue the fact that they didn't act a little bit earlier. So yeah, I think we're in a really good place. I think Ron and Mike hit on exactly what my thoughts are as well, which is, you know, we've, we've seen a lot of progress and we've seen a lot of good things and kind of some certainty and clarification on various different aspects that were, you know, up, up for contest really over the last five years before the RIA. And there's still a little bit of ways to go. We're seeing some of these challenges being brought up now where we're seeing the questions that Ron kind of posed, you know, not just to stakeholders in the industry, but also USCIS. And I think the hope is across, you know, for, for everyone that we get clarity, we get some kind of direction and people can kind of move forward with their investments, um, knowing exactly what to expect uh, for the years to come after they've invested and made their application. Yep, and I guess to kind of wrap that up, I, I would just say that in general, all of these changes implemented by the RAA, they, they generally increase transparency and reduced reduce transactional cost, um, which, which is good. And we're seeing investors recognize that and, and take advantage of it. If we look at the number of filings every quarter over the last two years since the RA went into effect about two years ago, you know, this month, we're seeing volumes increase significantly, you know, quarter over quarter. And so, you know, it's clear that investors are, you know, responding very positively to to these changes and are you know are, are are taking action and are investing in projects and as Ron pointed out you know there are a lot of projects available on the market uh, which is great um, you know we really believe in 
a free market economy, consumer choice. You know, the more options you have, the better, especially when we're talking about a very large sum of money. Um, that that that's really that's really good, and more transparency, access to financial statements, records, um, all that also helps investors identify projects that you know are going to have the highest likelihood of, of of succeeding and creating all the all the required jobs. Um, with that, uh, I'll turn it over uh, and let Mike uh, walk us through some of the current rural projects that we have available and. Um, and then I can walk us through the two different urban options that we have, and then, um, yeah, then then we'll uh, we'll wrap it up. Perfect. Thanks, Sam. And at the highest level, a lot of the things that Ron discussed go into how we think about projects. So the rural versus urban divide. Um, we have three rural deals. We have two different urban deals, two different styles on, on the same project that follows the urban TEAs because we think it's important for investors to have those types of choices. And we have focused more heavily on rural and most of our rural deals are very similar. They're large deals, well under construction, all the capitals in place. And EB5 is a, uh, a, a nice to have in the deal to push it forward. So for example, uh, the three deals you can see at the top, the Twin Lakes, Georgia project, this is a 1300 uh, home neighborhood. They've already built uh, almost 500 of those houses, sold over 600 of those houses, and they continue to move. There's likely five years left of construction. They've created thousands of jobs, and it's been one of our most attractive uh, rural EB-5 projects with two prior funds with 956F approval and 526Es approved. So uh, that's been uh, a really popular deal for a lot of reasons, as you can imagine. And then we have two other deals that fall more in the uh, ski resort out west rural categories versus more right outside of a city. And that's the Kindred Resort in Wahali. Wahali is in Park City. And Kindred is at the Keystone Ski Resort right outside of Denver, Colorado. And with all of our rural deals, we've worked to structure them with a general five-year loan term, either with a one or two one-year extension options. And in a way that we feel like we have very strong collateral, clear line of repayment, the jobs created for investors, and work to minimize the immigration and financial risk. And we're happy to talk about any of these three in more detail. Just please reach out to us, and I'll, I'll pass it back to Sam to run through the urban deals that we have and why we designed them the way that we did based on the sustainment guidance. Thanks, Mike. And, and generally, we, we are seeing a lot of interest in the rural projects specifically for domestic H-1B Indian investors and overseas Chinese investors are probably the two largest individual buckets of clients, along with several other um, specific countries as well. The ability to do that concurrent filing, everything is current. And also, you know, as Ron mentioned, you know, we're seeing approvals for these projects within a year. Um, so not only are you getting the adjustment of status, work permit, EAD, and advanced parole travel documents in just a few months, but you're also, you know, getting the green card, you know, within a year uh, in, in many cases, which is incredible when you compare it against some of the other, um, you know, waiting lines, which are, you know, decades long, depending on depending on priority date. So it really is a major, major advantage, particularly for investors who are already domestic in the U.S. and can take advantage of the concurrent filing um, on the urban side. Um, we do have a project called Boynton Beach, which is being developed by Coulter. They're one of the largest single family uh, and um, general residential developers in the southeastern United States. They were just ranked in the top 20 in 2023. Um, they've been in business for almost 30 years, perfect track record. They've done more than 15 EB-5 projects with us. And this is another um, very cookie cutter uh, EB-5 project that we're working on with them in South Florida, very close to where uh, Ron has retired uh, down in South Florida. Great location, very close to the beach. News to me if I'm retired. We're working no remotely. No one told me that. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're working remote, I guess, is the right term. Um, <laughs> anyway, this... Th this is one where construction is, is early on, uh, and the goal with these urban projects, these and other ones that we have in the works, is to provide a shorter capital deployment period where investors have line of sight to get their, their capital back a bit faster 
than in some of the rural projects where it tends to be a little bit longer, um, more in the five to six year range for the rural projects, whereas in the urban projects, we're targeting a much shorter three to four year time horizon. Um, and again, the main difference here is that you're able to get the work and travel permit uh, in both urban and rural, assuming your country is current on the visa bulletin that we talked about earlier. There's no change there, but the temporary green card um, is going to be a lot faster in rural. You know, we're seeing a lot of that within 12 months. Um, there have been a lot of applications in urban, and we did a lot of analysis and a completely separate webinar on on urban uh, and, and the backlog that we believe already exists there, particularly for Indian and Chinese investors. But long story short, if you're Indian or Chinese, what we believe is if you invest today in an urban project, you're going to be looking at a multi-year backlog, you know, probably five plus years um, before you'd get the temporary green card. And so, you know, for investors where, you know, the timing isn't that important, but getting their capital back faster is more important, urban is a good option. Um, but for investors who just want the green card as fast as possible, and they don't want to hear about staying on another uh, EAD or travel permit for for many years, the the rural is going to be is going to be the best fit. So I think high level summary, EB five is no longer one size fits all. Um, we have we have a really good article on that as well. It's going to really depend on what your preferences are, what country were you born in, where are you living now. Do you want the green card faster? Or do you want your money back faster? How important is return timing? Um, all those kind of questions are going to fit in, and um, and you know Ron will tell you he's in the legal business. You, you you can't have everything, right? Do you want it fast, cheap, or correct? And pick two, because you're not going to get you're not going to get all three. If you want it fast and cheap, it's not going to be correct. If you want it correct and fast, it's not going to be cheap, right? So you're not going to get everything that you want in, in a project. Unfortunately, that's just not going to happen. You've got to prioritize what are the most important things given your personal situation and your financial situation. And then once you've kind of thought through that, then apply that framework and select the project that you, know, you believe is the best fit uh, for that. Um, and Ahmed, I'll turn it over to you. Any any concluding or summary thoughts on on the different projects and how we approach it? Yeah, no, I think I think you kind of hit the nail on the head. Um, you know, we've we've got a wide portfolio here, a wide range of different projects, and like just like you said, each of them kind of hits on a different uh, thing, and each project has its own you know individual kind of pros and you know cons. Uh, there, there's no way you know there's no such thing as a perfect project, and we're very transparent about, you know, what what a project excels at and maybe where it's a little bit lacking. And, you know, to your point, every project will have something that that fits a need for for those who are looking. So, yeah, this is, you know, just just a kind of glimpse into how we structure projects, why we think EB5 is in a great spot. Um, thank you so much, Ron, for joining. I think your insights are always incredibly useful for anyone who's listening and uh, even for us who, you know, we, we agree with everything you're, that you're saying and think the same way, but it's still here. It's still nice to hear you uh, talk about it. I think when Ron talks, everyone listens. So yeah, I think I agree with everything that was said and look forward to hearing from anyone who's attending. Uh, feel free to reach out to us by our website. Uh, we even have a, a phone number on the screen that you can, you can WhatsApp as well. Um, Ron's uh, firm, Class of Immigration Law Partners is also on the screen. Feel free to reach out to him and his team as well to schedule some time to talk and chat if you think EB5 may be right for you. Perfect. Thank you very much, Ahmed. And thank you again, Ron, for, for carving out some time to chat with us. We, we really appreciate it. And yeah, we'll, uh, we'll make sure this, 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 gets, this gets published and out there. And yeah, thank you everyone for taking the time to join us. And again, if you would like a copy of the slides, please email us info at EB5AN. We're happy to provide them. Uh, and if you are interested in, in pursuing EB5, first step is hire an immigration attorney. Ron's firm does great work. Uh, so please reach out to them for help with source of funds documentation. And if any of these projects are, are interesting um, or you're just kind of in the early phases of, of exploring whether EB5 is the right decision for you and your family, feel free to reach out, chat with any of us. 
uh, and, and we'll be happy to get you more information.